You know, government makes the rules. Government makes the currency. Government sets up how money will be distributed. Your government has an immense amount of power. And a number of things have failed with governments. And here is trying to say that Uber is trying to stop the big speculation and go off into more business, spend money into investment and not speculation. But of course, he did virtually nothing about that. And so, first off, no regulation. So we already mentioned before the, the failures of regulation, but the regulations they did have were so hard to follow that banks could pretty much do whatever they wanted and very convoluted. The company, the people that are, who were supposed to regulate didn't want to regulate. That's actually an issue right now with the Federal Reserve. And especially no regulation with the stock market. There's nothing to control the bubble, nothing to control stock trades. Insider trading ran rampant where people with secret information could quarter and either buy stock when the value was low or sell before the price tanked. Companies did not have to report their actual earnings. They lied all the time. Now, technically, this is fraud, but it's still really hard to enforce if that doesn't happen. Also, there's no safety net. Now, this goes totally against trick about economics. That's why I put that in parentheses. Any aid for the poor, it was seen as, well, that they'll just drink it away or they'll become dependent. The only aid should go to the very wealthy. But the problem, for example, of not having unemployment insurance, when there was massive layoffs, this tank demand. Because all of a sudden, you have people with money spending. Overnight, they had no money, and they didn't spend. Unemployment insurance provides at least a little bit of that payback, so that their payback, their salary back, so demand does not tank, does not tank completely. Also, the Federal Reserve, which was created back in 1913, is supposed to be able to deal with the money supply to handle some of these issues, just as it does today. And it has many of the same problems today as it had then. But the basic idea was, if there's a bubble, they should try to stop the bubble by raising interest rates. But they didn't raise interest rates really until the beginning of 29. So in 29, and then they didn't raise it that much. So that encouraged more speculation. Now, part of the reason was it was still pretty new on how to do that. But the other part was blatant conflict of interest. They were making money. The banks were making money. The Federal Reserve was infiltrated, kind of controlled by the banks. And then when the bubble crashed, that's when you lower interest rates. But they didn't. They didn't lower interest rates hardly at all in 29 after the crash. They thought if they kept interest rates higher, that would help banks because they needed higher returns. But instead, it squeezed credit even more, dropped demand. Terrible move. Terrible. So with that. And then, of course, one of the most infamous laws in history, the Holly Smoot tariff. Smoot is the kind of name you got to yell, don't you think? Smoot. I smoot you. He was a senator from Utah. But they increased the tariffs dramatically. Now, the thought was this would raise prices, which they, they do, but raise prices for American manufacturers, allow them to make more money, get people back to work. But it was an absolute disaster because think about it for a second. It raises prices at a time where people were losing their jobs. And so this tariff not only made things worse, it, when the United States raised their tariffs on goods from, let's say, Britain, France, and Germany, what did they do in return? Exactly. And this is going to trigger a worldwide trade war. At a time when everybody needed to sell products, it triggered almost a complete collapse of trade, which had never really recovered since World War I. And this just stopped it. Remember, overproduction, we have a surplus, you want to trade it. There's actually a term for this where they raise tariffs in this kind of time. They call it beggar thy neighbor. Basically, where you raise your tariffs to kind of cheat your neighbor out of their surplus. So the problem is it triggers a trade war. A terrible move. And Hoover supported and wanted this. That was the traditional idea is this would put more money in the hands of wealthy so they could start investing. But the thing was, 
No one's buying goods. Why would anybody invest? In 1931, Henry Ford gave his son Edsel a million dollars in gold. Yes, he named his son Edsel. A million dollars in gold. So we had plenty of money sitting around. At the same time, he shut down the largest factory in the world called the River Rouge factory because no one's buying cars. He had plenty of money. But why would anybody sell things unless people are buying? So with that, but probably the biggest thing is austerity. And the definition of austerity is cutting government spending. At a time where demand was low, but government, that gives the government the opportunity at these times to spend more money. Give people money so they spend it increasing demand or buy stuff like build roads, build dams, build airports, those kind of things. That gets increases demand. Now that goes against trickle-down economics, but here's what happens in a depression. Tax revenues drop. Think about it for basic reasons. People lose their jobs, they can't pay taxes. Or people quit spending as much money, therefore that drops other tax revenues. So that means the government deficit, the gap between spending and revenues drops. I say drop, I mean raises. The deficit raises. That gap raises. So this government debt goes up because tax revenues go down. You can imagine the opposite happens in boom time. Government revenues go up. Government revenues go up. You know, the boom time of the 50s and 60s, the, the massive U.S. debt it incurred during World War II was pretty much disappeared, even though the, government, the country always ran up deficits because spending was up or uh, the, the economy was booming. But back to this. And this cartoon shows the fear of many that government was spending too much. And if all of us have got to tighten our belt and save money to pay back our debts, so should the federal government. And so this is a cartoon trying to emphasize this common sense. You know, if, if, if you have debts, you save your money. So it's save, save, save. If people are in debt the and trying to save money, the government should do the same. Well, they cut spending dramatically in 32. When the Depression first began, Hoover actually would initiate a couple, um, they, they called them public works programs. Remember internal improvements of the 19th century building roads? They called them public works. Today we would say infrastructure, which is a relatively new word. You're building dams, roads, whatever. So for example, they built a, they just started not really doing much, but started getting construction ready for a massive dam on the Colorado River, but eventually become Hoover Dam. But in 32, they cut back almost all of it. They did other things, a few other roads, road projects, and things like that to try to boost demand. But deficits were going up, so they cut spending. And what happened here is one other important thing. Hoover believed there should be no direct aid for people. He did believe on helping businesses. He believed that businesses, should, we should give them money with the idea of being they'll hire more workers. But direct aid to workers, one of two things will happen. They will become dependent upon government money but working, or they'll drink it all away or waste it because that's the way most people are. So what attitude did he have? What philosophy does that follow? It's very social Darwinistic. This feeling that we can't give people money, they'll just, they'll just give up, they'll become dependent, they'll drink it away. So, if there's no direct aid, no government spending, demand tanked. Demand tanked even more. Remember, we already have debt deflation. Everybody's paying off their debt at the same time. Demand is dropping. People aren't spending money, they're saving it, they're hoarding money if they have it. And now the government quit spending. And here is the, the kind of the attitude, mocking Hoover's attitude. Here's the American public drowning because of the depression. Here it's supposed to represent someone wealthy, and it's a book on how to swim. To someone who's drowning. I find that to be pretty clever. And so with that, just an absolute disaster. So demand got worse. Remember, you have to look at this in the context of debt deflation. 
No one is spending money, and now the government spends money, and it makes or government doesn't spend money, and it makes demand. The United States was not the only country that did this. France, Britain did this, and most famously Germany. Germany dramatically cut back on government spending in 31, 32. Unemployment went up. Yeah, I wonder what political party benefited from that. And so consumer demand is already dropping. And now it's going to lengthen this. It just makes it potentially worse. In your lifetime, there was a pretty big, they called it the stimulus bill in 2009 during the depression. It's kind of what President Obama ran on. It probably wasn't big enough. It was only, only, only about $700 million. <laughs> I mean, that's, but we, we're, that, that's pocket change for us. But it probably should have been about $1.5 trillion. But they are, they lowballed it. And then in 2010, they cut government spending dramatically. Dramatically, 2010, 2011. And, you know, that, Depression went on and on. In fact, the U.S. never reached uh, back up to the old trend line for the GDP until 2018. So the depression was really long. And saw an element of that last year, too. And then this leads to the next thing, a massive loss in commerce. Remember during a boom, everyone that got told you, oh, it's going on forever. And then in a bus, it's really this sense of doom. And the loss of confidence comes in three. First off, people blame themselves for the losing of their jobs. In fact, there was a whole rash of, of men abandoning their families after they lost their job. And don't even think about the logic of it because people panic and scared don't think logically. But if they felt like such a failure, they couldn't face their family. Even though people all over were losing their jobs, hardworking people were losing their jobs because there were no jobs. And then they started losing faith in the government. So all of these shanty towns, towns with thousands and thousands of homeless people propped up, and they called them Hoovervilles. So they lost faith in their government, Hoovervilles. The largest will soon be in Washington, D.C. And then they started losing faith in the whole system. Not just the leaders of government, maybe the government system, maybe the economic system. It's no coincidence that you're going to have growth of socialist and communist parties, but also growth of fascists. And in fact, a lot of the wealthiest people in the United States began to seriously question this whole democratic republic and say, we got to put in strong men. And there would be an attempt to overthrow President Roosevelt and have a coup and replace it with fascists. Is that the one you did? Yeah. So this is all coming. And you see this all over, all over Europe and Asia. Japan would become a, the army would just literally just take over. This weird kind of way it happened there. Spain would go to civil war. France would have one government after another government. Fall, fail, fall, another one rise, fall. And then, of course, most famously, because of austerity, loss of confidence, loss of faith. Got to get rid of this weak democratic system. It's no coincidence that Hitler would take power. These are all posters from 32. And it's pretty clever, isn't it? What, is he fo what are they focusing on? I will get you a job. Jobs. That's what it's talking here. And so in January of 33, because of fear of the communists, Hitler took power. That's why depression, you know, this was a scary, scary time. And it's so ironic that Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler took power at the same time and they were such polar opposites. It's just so interesting how that happened. So we're gonna jump right to this. And so this is not a cause. So this is what, one more thing we have to get through in 32. So to show how the depths of the depression was in, nothing shows it more. In the bonus hunt. And I guess the other thing I, I'm just going to mention very quickly, the other thing that might show it is how gangsters became heroes. People who rob banks like Pretty Boy Floyd became the most famous Americans in the world because they robbed banks and everybody owed money to the banks. 
And that's your society's kind of breaking down. But the bonus army was this. So I've mentioned this once before because Mellon was opposed. The bonus was due in 1954. And you wait, 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 wait. Yeah. That's a 54. No, that should be 45. 45. Eh, ain't got it. 1945. It was just going to be a thousand dollars. It wasn't going to be a big bonus, but it's to veterans of World War I. And the idea was, is like when they're near retirement, this would be a little bit of a bonus. But more and more people started saying that they should get the bonus now, not only because if they're in the depths of the recession, but this will increase demand. People who don't have money, you give them money and they immediately spend it. Immediately. You give people money who already have money and they might save it, they might invest it, they might buy gold gilded toilet seats. And so with that, well, it's got is it a former sergeant in the United States Army, Walter White. He's well, um, well, um, he started setting up with uh announcing they should do this, and 14,000 people or veterans eventually would march to Washington, DC. Many and brought their families. Their children, wives and children, this wife and children. And think about this. Remember the Moxie's Army in 1894? Remember that during the Panic of 1893? This is a very similar thing. And people don't just all of a sudden, I'm going to go march on Washington, D.C. That gives you an idea how absolutely desperate and terrified people were. I mean, they must have nothing. And if they're my only chance, my only chance. And then so it became focused on this is my only chance. A thousand dollars now would be about let's see, one play. About a good sum of money, but not like permanently helping. And so they marched on DC and they started taking up residence in at first abandoned buildings, but there's this big kind of swampy area that's not all people because it's Washington, DC, now it's all packed. It was called Anacostia Flats. It's kind of swamp land near the Potomac River. And they started setting up the biggest Hoover tech, Hoover bill of them all. Well, Hoover was disgusted by this. As he saw, I'm not going to help them. Then everybody will want a handout and everybody will quit working. And so he totally ignored this. Did not want to help. Well, the House would eventually vote yes. They voted to give a bonus. But the Senate and Hoover begged senators to not vote for this. And the Senate is always a little bit more conservative. But remember, the goal of the Senate was to stop action in the House. And so Hoover got his wish and the Senate stopped it. And the bonus army, I mean, they just it was crushing to them. Some began to go off, find another either go back home or go someplace else. Many of them stayed thousands. This was going into August. So imagine how hot it would be in Washington, D.C. They did this march in front of walk the, the Capitol, begging for one more vote. And many of them didn't have shoes. They couldn't afford it, didn't have shoes. So they marched in bare feet on the hot sidewalk. They called it the death march, begging for one more vote. In fact, as Hoover's limousine was going to the Capitol, on, or was going to go to the Capitol on the last, you know, he always would, uh, it, was, it was pretty much, the, used to be the tradition for the president to announce or to address the Senate before they adjourned. He was, a, his limousine was not really attacked, but more, you know, guys are young, coming yelling at the president's limousine. And the Secret Service decided you can't go. They were really worried. And so without the president coming, without any formal warning, they did one of these adjourn and everyone ran. All the members of the House and the Senate. Now, this had been done about 40 years earlier. But we have the U.S. Capitol and then the office buildings for the House and the Senate are across the streets around. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., they have the big office buildings. That's where the senators have their office. There's underground little tunnels with little electric trains that connect the Capitol to these office buildings to allow the senators to go back and forth, the members of the House. So rather than face the death march, 
they all took those trains and got out of town. They skipped out on it. So just like literally overnight, they just found out these, these four men marching outside. They're gone. And once that happened, Hoover ordered the army to remove. Now, the army was given the order, do not use any violence, but use any means necessary to get rid of it. Which, of course, the chief of staff, a guy named Douglas MacArthur, some of you might know who he is. MacArthur used that as an excuse to hear American soldiers. You could see them. They're rousting. And these are veterans of World War I. They're rousting. They have gas masks on. They use tear gas. They burnt down all of that Hooverville where the bonus army was and all those belongings there and marched them out of town. Two soldiers were killed. They were bombing um, smoke grenades, caught a fire in two minutes. Um, two people died. Hoover technically did not give the order. And MacArthur, who um, said there was all a bunch of communists, which wasn't quite true, he liked the credit and took credit for it. But Hoover is very much going to be blamed. This was quite justified. Hoover made the order, allowed it to happen. And so this made Hoover seem even more. Made Hoover seem even more like he didn't care about it. In fact, more and more, they would say something called the forgotten. Just the, the vast majority of people are totally forgotten. And so with this, this is all in 32. The, pre the nominating conventions are about ready to happen for president. So you can imagine this would be the biggest issue. The bonus army scattered. But armies of veterans marching on the Capitol? Sounds like things are falling apart. And while this is going on, law and order was breaking down in the rural parts of the country, especially the south of this time. A starvation in the countryside that people to some loot stores and just basically ignore banker or, or government orders to remove from their homes. So this looked like it was all falling apart. We're going to jump to so. So we jump right into the New Deal. So we'll get into the New Deal. You know, we think about the United States, so many things about the U.S. what directly affects us of the United States. Sure. Obviously, the founding of the country, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution are incredibly important. But our biggest impacts were Reconstruction and the New Deal that most directly affect us, give us the, the United States we know of. So let's talk about, there's Franklin Roosevelt. These are some of the government programs and that direct government action. But we got to talk a little bit about FDR. So his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, went by TR. So he used the initials. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, he, FR didn't quite work, and then his death, he didn't want to. So he went to FDR, and he was an up-and-coming politician. He was a he was a Democrat in New York. His his cousin was a progressive Republican, but the Democratic Party was stronger in New York. So Roosevelt made a very pragmatic decision: if I want any kind of progressive laws, I got to be a Democrat. 1920, he was a vice presidential candidate. They got swamped, but he seemed like he is going places. And the big thing he wanted was get his name out there, become governor of New York, just like his cousin, and maybe president. Incredibly ambitious, not like the greatest student. He kind of cruised along, but very smart and an amazing politician. I'll tell you a couple of stories about his um, politics. But in 1921, we're not 100% sure it was polio now, but everyone believed it, and th it doesn't change the fact that the, it was assumed, it was believed, if you believe it, it's true, he got polio in 1921. And the reason why that's such a big deal is polio was the most dreaded fear disease that the United States was. Yeah. I put it up here because I always mispronounce it, but it's Ian Bear syndrome, which has many of the same symptoms. And so we very well could have had that. It, so it seems very much like polio. And that's something they could not, uh, they could not diagnose. But 
What matters is everyone, including me, believing my goal. And polio was so random. So it would be like if, if someone caught in the classroom, this, you know, watch out, there's a polio outbreak. Somebody in the class is usually transferred by touch, touch. And they could touch someone. There's always a story about people touching a doorknob. And 100 people will use the same doorknob after them. Nothing happens to them except for one person. That makes it just so much more scary, doesn't it? Because it's just so random. And the same other randomness would be how, how bad the disease would hit people. Some people, they would hardly notice it. Maybe just have like a little bit of a cold. Some people would be paralyzed from the neck down, maybe perhaps even die. And so it was like every parent's fear that just that terrible, iffy chance you get polio. And this would become the symbol of the uh, polio. You know what that is? In iron lung. And it kind of, I think, wants to create some of a vacuum, but if you're paralyzed, if you're not, you can't breathe. So you'd be in this cylinder, and they would try to seal off as much as possible. The vacuum combined with something pressing down in your lungs, it's really it's an awful thing to get out of the toxin. That'd be how you breathe. And that was everyone's fear. It just stuck in that for the rest of it. Holy, it's terrible. And we also don't talk about it. At least that's what I'm trying to talk about. And it was like, oh. oh. In fact, it was one of those things where he first came track and he thought he had a flu, just a little sick. And then for a while there, he was almost completely paralyzed from the neck. He could barely breathe. Now, fortunately, he regained the feeling from waist up, not his not his hips, but up. So he could breathe. That was it. He never really ever. And you can imagine how people thought. Well, frankly, most folks from the place, it's not too bad he got pulled over. He's paralyzed his thing. People with that kind of disability would just assume from good times. Especially back then. And then there was a lot of discrimination and stuff. It seems so. I think it also plays in with the fear. It's because everyone was scared of this and they wanted to avoid it. And my grandpa got them. And he he, lost, he couldn't use his left leg hardly at all. He got him 46. And in 48, because of circulation problems it caused, it started a series of heart attacks that eventually killed him. I never met My mom's dad died in his 47. So polio was a very real thing. Should have when Jonas Salk found that polio vaccine, it, it, it like saved. I still have a little mark from the polio and smallpox vaccine right here. They don't get smallpox vaccines here. Yes, it's making a read out. But they have a little mark right here. And with that, so. He's not. Well, he wasn't going to quit. Roosevelt kept working and he developed his upper body, worked and worked. And we don't realize it, how much your hips, you stand with your hips, you walk with your hips. He didn't have it. And yet, in 1928, he gave the nominate. Oh, everyone thought his career was over. He gave the nominating address for Al Smith. Remember, remember Al Smith, Catholic? I played you that voice. He gave the nominating address of the Democratic Convention. Not just that, he walked to the podium. And he stood at the podium and gave a speech and then walked off. Everybody had heard he was paralyzed and done and polio had beaten another one. And here is Roosevelt stepping up and doing that. Uh, this is not a study, I'll put that away. Not again, or I throw it away. And so with that, Roosevelt got up and stood at the podium. How he did it is absolutely remarkable. Yeah. How he did it. 
So he worked on his stomach, worked on his legs, worked on his shoulders. And at first he had parallel bars and he would stand himself up and got leg braces and hip braces that he could lock. And they allowed him to move his leg a little bit or the leg could move and then could lock it. So he'd stand, but he still had to use your stomach muscles. He'd be exhausted after giving the speech. And then what he would do is using his stomach, he would shift his weight. I can't even do it without, your hips do everything. And shift his weight and give the illusion of walking. He's paralyzed, but using his stomach and his shoulders. And at first he did bars, and then he would use, if he had a rail, but no rail, he would have a cane. And usually get one of his sons, his sons were these kind of, you know, they're kind of big guys, and they worked on, they would use his arm like, that's like a rail, and they'd walk next to him, they'd hold him, and he'd walk slow, but it looked like walking. And they all went through the whole thing of, okay, if we're going to be walking, we should act like we're just talking. And so they would be, you know, they, they worked on this. Don't show how hard it is. Smile. So we all be like, <laughs> and it worked. It gave the illusion of walking. And there's something else. Reporters at the time just didn't take pictures of him in his wheelchair. Didn't take pictures of him walking. There's only a few seconds of film of him walking. It's absolutely remarkable. If this works. That's it. Look at that. Doesn't it look like he's lifting his leg? Isn't that remarkable? I like the hand with the cigarette pops in front of the camera. Well, when they made this is American experience on FDR, that was all they had. Well, we now know there's more. Here's one more of him going to an all-star baseball game. He loved baseball. This is with the Washington Senators. They used to be the Major League Baseball team there in Washington, D.C. Look at them on. Isn't that just remarkable? What determination he had. That somebody, it was just home footy, home, we'll see a little eight millimeter camera, someone's home video, home uh, movie camera. There's another one they just found two years ago too. So here's his wheelchair. And he would go in his wheelchair, he would drive, they would pick him up and put him in the driver's seat and he had a, a and he had a hand um, accelerator. It's all done by hand, hand stick shift. He had actually do the stick shift on the uh, steering wheel so he could drive. And they never showed him being picked up. So you can always have this illusion like he beat Polly. If he beat Polly, what's the match? What a great bit of acting. So with that, that's at the uh, um, FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C. And so the election of 32 will be Franklin Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover. And the Republicans are kind of stuck with Herbert Hoover. They've been talking trickle-down economics, and a lot of people were blaming it for the Depression and the austerity in the bonus army. Here is the Hoover's accomplishment, the barrel's dry. And Hoover was going to double down on this. And there's Franklin Roosevelt. There's his son standing right next to him. By the way, don't they just seem so happy? But Franklin Roosevelt. Now, at the nominating convention in Chicago, Roosevelt would come up with a slogan, partially on accident, called the New Deal. And Roosevelt would be the first presidential candidate to give a nominating acceptance speech at the convention. Normally, surrogates did it. He was waiting at Albany. And when he heard that Southern conservative Democrats had failed their effort to keep him from being the nominee, he flew from Albany to Chicago. Now, that today didn't seem like that big of a deal, but it was a massive deal then. He flew. There's, there were a number of cartoons. This is the most famous. Planes. Think about it. New, exciting, different. We're not going to do the old stuff anymore. We will do something uh, new, exciting, and here's the big aggressive. 
he promised aggressive government action. And in the speech, there was a line, I pledge you, I pledge to myself, I'm sorry, I pledge myself to a new deal to the American people. And once that came out, it was like, oh, that's the, that's the slogan. That is the slogan. And so this cartoon helped it. This is one of the more famous ones. Went on newspapers all over the country and the forgotten man. Very clever, isn't it? Good cartoon. And so promising government is going to step in. And he had some things he said he was going to do. Direct government aid, break up monopolies, regulate the stock market, regulate the banks. He made some other kind of vague promises like all candidates do. But he wasn't the only one to use plain illusion. Another weird parallel. Hitler used the same thing in Germany in 32. Hitler over Germany and flying a plane. Which is just so, yeah, just so weird, the whole thing. Look, so here's FDR in blue. Hoover was an incumbent. And he lost that badly. One of the biggest landslides in history. In 36, we'd be a bigger landslide. A massive sweep. And these states were close. And then the winter hit. This was the last president to be elected in November, but not be inaugurated until March. Remember that happened with Abraham Lincoln? He was elected in November, and by the time he was sworn in, the Confederacy was formed, and seven states had already seceded. Something very similar is going to happen here. Roosevelt be elected, and the world economy was falling apart. Soon there would be food riots virtual war in Detroit, and law began to break down. Oh, and an assassination attempt. Somebody tried to kill Roosevelt. He ended up murdering the mayor of Miami, sitting next to Roosevelt instead. I can't even imagine. Roosevelt would have been assassinated, I think, the country would. He's going to be. But it was this guy was um, the man who tried to kill him. Um, believe that Roosevelt was going to attack him. <laughs> yeah, they had some issues. That actually had nothing to do with Roosevelt's program. He just well, the largest factory in the United States, the River Rouge factory, the Ford factory, which Ford had shut down. Thousands of Ford workers marched on the River Rouge factory that winter, begging for a job. They were starving. Now, Ford, two things. Ford said, how can they give you a job? We don't have work. And secondly, you should, you should get a job. You're not working hard enough. I'm not kidding. He said both of those things. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, the grand thing that there was in the grand school, they were all the same. And the and Jerry, even though like Spencer and Ford addressed them, and he was like, okay, first of all, you should get off that river, or there are too many of you, the ice is going to break. Jerry could have, yeah. And when they marched on the factory, Ford guards opened up and murdered 20, murdered 20 marchers and wounding at least 50 more. And then farmers just revolted. Sioux City, Iowa was actually taken over by farmers and they shut down the courts who were foreclosing on farms. And then the bank failure started. I was in Roosevelt talking about this. I'm sitting in Albany because he knew this is his quote. You know, I'm sitting in Albany and watching the country fall apart. And I just realized I finally got what I always wanted to become president. <laughs> Just when the whole thing is falling apart. This was a, that's a Hoover bill. These are people kicked off their farm. It looked like it was old. And here's the thing, when Roosevelt was inaugurated, it's one of those times where his inaugural, inaugural address, everybody was listening. It's one of those moments and people forget how bad it is. 
And on that happy note, alrighty then. Everyone has the homework for stream break. We're good. I'm glad I gave it to you early so we got out there. Can I do another more extra credit? Yeah. Yes, yes. I would very good for getting He's gone to base yeah. on a kind of thing, polio and carry the whole disease. Yeah. But that was a big deal. He beat polio once to the depression. That's why he's on the diet. Thank you for being there. Yeah, I'm good. I'm always waiting for you to. Uh, we have a face tomorrow. What? We have a face tomorrow. Reading soon tomorrow. Oh, okay. It'll be really nice. Wait, where are you reading? It'll be in. I signed in on Thursday, 192. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And it's. Yeah, no more than. Eight. No more than. Yeah. Something. <laughs> I just want a quick little reading. Check the bell off. We're bit, I'm recording. How was your weekend? It was good. I had a powerlifting meeting Saturday. How'd you do it? Pretty good. I got uh, three first place medals and then awesome. three second place medals. Did you get first? Um, remember because I, I did a bunch there 